continuing chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through a very important book filled with a message to all of us, to Israel, but it's a message to us to really awaken spiritually. It's a call to revival. It's a call to have an authentic relationship to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to understand more of your desire to bless us and what that means. Because, Lord, we know that you order our steps. You show us the way in which we should go. And, Lord, that's the way of greatest blessing and favor poured out. And so we want to understand it because we want to live it. And so we authentically desire tonight that you would move by your spirit. There's a genuine hunger and thirst for your word to be understood. And so we long tonight for you to just minister by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezekiel is a prophet. He's uh, living in Babylon. As you know, Babylon destroyed Israel. At this point, however... Uh, they're not completely destroyed. And so there are messages that are sent from Ezekiel back to Israel. And also at the same time, there are messages given to the people living in Babylon. What is the uh, mission of Ezekiel? What is his purpose? What is he trying to accomplish? Because I think it's good for us to see the big picture. And the big picture, you can say it in one word, revival. God wants revival. God wants their hearts to be his because their hearts haven't been his. Their hearts have been after every ungodly, worldly thing you can possibly imagine and that wandering heart messed up their lives and look, they're his people. You know, he calls them the, the, the bride that he called out of Egypt and he, that's what we saw, you know, last week in Ezekiel 16, how uh, Israel was his bride, his beloved. Oh, how he bestowed upon his beloved all of these treasures and blessing and gifts. And he loved his wife, you know. And, and then she betrayed him and she went after her lovers and she uh, uh, was an adulterer. And just it was just really a, a bad chapter. It was an ugly chapter last week, wouldn't you admit it's a tough chapter because you have to see it in all its ugly reality. But that's good for us to see it in its ugly reality. Because that's what wakes us up. That's what alerts us. We need to be authentic, genuine, real. And if you're not authentic and genuine, real, then it's just religion. It's just an outward emptiness, an outward shell, rather, with inward emptiness and that is a lie. And God doesn't want that. He wants there to be an authentic, genuine reality because that's the place of relationship and love. See, that love is a very important part of our relationship to the Lord. I love you. Oh, I'll pour out my favor on you. My spirit of life will be given unto you. And we are going to walk together. You know, you get this picture of Adam walking together with God in the cool of the evening. There's relationship with the living God. It's authentic and real. And that's, that's a great picture for us. I want to walk with you. You know, there's just this beautiful picture of, I don't know about, the, uh, about you, but I love the evenings of summer. You know, the sun is kind of getting down. It's still kind of warm. And it's just really fun to go out for a walk late at night, you know, like 9, 9.30, you know, you're walking and it's still warm and there's still a glow in the sky. You're just kind of walking. Isn't that kind of just a special part of summer, a special part of the day? And, you know, it's just kind of fun to go take a stroll. Well, that's a great picture. Just go out for a stroll with God, you know, and it's good. And there's a, there's a joy. There's an authentic love that's happening. And this is good. This is really good. What God is, is longing for, that fellowship, we just enjoy. We're going to walk together. We're going to take steps through life. We're going to do this together. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'll never leave you. I won't forsake you. I'll be with you even to the end of the age, I'm telling you. And I'm going to pour my life out on you. It's going to be so good. Now, that's a great picture for us. 
because it, it helps us to see what might be, what God could have with us. So that way, when we start wandering away from it, then we long for the real. We long, we miss that. You know, see, that's, that's really, really important. Oh, man, I miss that. I miss the days, oh, Lord, when we, I worshiped, and it was so sweet, and, and Bible studies we did, and, and God, those were so many awesome days. And here I am, I'm in the world now, and I've just messed up my life, and I made one stupid decision after the other, and now I just feel so yucky inside. My soul is all, this is bad. I just miss, oh, God, I miss you. I really want that again. See, I think this is important for us to see what might be, what God could have in us and with us so that we long for it and hunger for it and desire it. That's, that's what God is saying. Do you hunger? Do you have a thirst? Do you long for these things? Let it be real. Uh, on authentic genuineness to that longing. That's what he's saying. And that's really what this is about because Israel had been so messed up and so now they're in, they're in Babylon. But he's got their ear. He's got Ezekiel. And they respect him, but he's calling it out straight. He's not pulling any punches because he's trying to wake them up spiritually so that they will stop that business of going after these worldly uh, idols. Now, today, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the same kinds of idols. You know, typically you don't set things up, you know, you don't go out to the forest and cut down a tree and start carving it up and find some guy to Hey, do you, do you deal in silver? Oh, good. Would you mind overlaying some silver on this thing I made? Oh, what is it? It's a god. You made it. I know, but it's a god, you know? And uh, it's like power. It's like, you know, he's like a fertility god, you know, and stuff. Well, that's just wood. You want silver on that? I do, I do. And so, you know, can, we don't do that today. That's silliness, you say. Right, it is. We don't do that. But do we have idols today? I'm telling you, we live in a society filled with idols. I mean, it's filled with them. They're everywhere. It's, it's infesting our society. I don't know if you know this, this. Our society is in trouble. Have you noticed this? It's getting worse. It's getting worse. One generation is getting worse. Why? Because the idols are getting, they're everywhere. It's infested. This world is, you could... People can get hooked up with every crazy nonsense pollution imaginable, imaginable, and the soul will get sick. So we got a choice. We have a choice in this world. We got a choice of what we do with our lives. We get a choice of how we live in this world. We get a choice of the path. You can weave your way through this world on a godly path. It's possible. We live in a society that's infested with idols, but you can weave your way through this world. You can walk your way through this world and have it be godly and have it be honorable to your Lord. And when you take your last breath, then you just keep walk, right on walking. You walk right into the presence of the Lord and it's just going to get more beautiful. You can live your life in beauty and honor and in majesty. You can live your life with the filling of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that filled the early church, the same Holy Spirit is given to every one of us. You can walk, I can walk. We can make a choice to walk this world step by step with the Lord. We get to make that choice, right? And that's why we're choosing here. We, we, you took some steps, you got in your car or walked or however you got here, and, and you chose to sit where you're sitting. You made that choice. And you said, you know what? I, you know what I want to do tonight? I want to, I want to go and I want to hear the word. I want to hear chapter by chapter. I want to hear the word tonight. There's a lot of things on TV, I think. Isn't the World Cup on or something? You could watch that. You could watch the, of course, basketball's over. You could watch, you know, I mean, there's things to do, but a choice. I make a choice. I want to grow in the Lord. I want to be strengthened in his word, and I want to learn. I want to grow in my faith, and I want to learn. Amen? And that's why we're here. So this is what Ezekiel was trying to get them to see. 
He wants them to see it, open their eyes to it. All right, let's jump into it. Chapter 17. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now, son of man, propound a riddle, and speak a parable to the house of Israel. So a, a riddle. A riddle is something that was kind of common in those days. Uh, you would throw out a, a, a picture of something, you know, Samson did this, a lion, you know, and then there's, and so it's a picture of something that is significant. It's a picture to teach. So it's a riddle, a parable, say this to the house of Israel, say this, thus says the Lord God. Now there was a great eagle with great wings, long pinions and a full plumage of many colors that came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. So this great eagle, a great eagle, swooped into Lebanon and with its talons latched onto the top of a cedar and just snapped it off. This is the picture. He plucked off the topmost of its young twigs and he brought it to a land of merchants. And he set it in the city of traders. What does this mean? Then he also took some of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow along the, uh, along the water. It sprouted and became a low spreading vine with its branches turning towards him, the eagle. But its roots remained under it. So it became a vine, yielded shoots, and sent out branches. Now, there was another eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and sent out its branches toward him from the beds where it was planted that he might water it. It was planted in good soil beside abundant waters that it might yield branches and bear fruit and become a splendid vine. Thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers, so that all its sprouting leaves wither, and neither by great strength nor by many people can it be raised from its roots again? Behold, though it is planted, will it thrive? Will it not completely wither as soon as the east wind strikes it? Wither on the beds where it grew. What does this mean? It's very intriguing. By the way, it is intriguing, and some suggest and I think quite wrongly suggest, that because it's a picture of an eagle, they say, aha, we must have a picture here of the United States because on the top of the flagpole there's an eagle, and you know the eagle is the representation, the mascot, you might say, of the United States. They say, aha, we've been looking for some way to indicate where America is found in Scripture, and I believe we have found it because it is an eagle. They have not found it. That was wrong. Because the Lord describes and he explains it. Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. Now, say this to the rebellious house. Do you not know what these things mean? Say, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem. Okay, so the king of Babylon was the first eagle. Strong and mighty, the first eagle. Say, behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem took its king and its princes. He snapped off the uppermost branch, the king and his princes. With his great talons, he swooped in, snapped it off, took it. Going on, he, he took its king and its princes, brought them to him in Babylon, place of merchants. The, the, by the way, that's a good phrase to describe Babylon, the city of merchants, because in the book of Revelation, Babylon is a description of some city of merchants that is destroyed in the latter days, and it represents, well, we'll get there. We're in Ezekiel. We will get to Revelation. And he took one of the royal family, and he made a covenant with this royal family. He made a covenant Putting him under oath, he also took away the mighty of the land, this is the seed part, 
that the kingdom might be in subjection, not exalting itself, but keeping his covenant that it might continue. And this is Zedekiah. Uh, so he swooped in, he broke off the upper branches. He made a covenant with Zedekiah that Zedekiah, as king of Israel, would be, and Israel would be, under Babylon. And they made a covenant. This is the word covenant. It's a very important word. And that is an agreement so that Israel would be a vassal state of Babylon and pay tributes. In other words, send money. That means that you under them. So you send money and you obey their direction and you are subservient and you don't fight it. And in fact, it's interesting because through Jeremiah and the other prophets of that time living in Jerusalem, the word actually came to Zedekiah and the others and said, hear the word of the Lord. You need to go in cooperation, and he will take you. But come out to him and yield yourself to him. This was the word of the Lord. If you resist him, he will destroy you. Do not resist him. Come out to him, and you'll have your life as booty. Come out to him. Why would he do that? To teach them a lesson. He was going to bring them to Babylon to teach them to honor his name. In fact, he said, you know, I've given you a direction many, many years ago to honor my name in this land. You refuse to do it. You won't do it. You're completely rebellious. You're heart of heart. You turn to every possible thing except to me. And so enough's enough. I've asked this land to have its Sabbath rest. You refuse to give it its Sabbath rest, so I will give it its Sabbath rest. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. That's the exact number of Sabbath years you have missed. So there, God is going to show them. And actually, it's interesting, I'm going to protect you there. Because if you go to Babylon, you will actually be in the eye of the storm. And in the eye of the storm, you will be protected. God knows what he is doing. If you would just go to the eye of the storm and let the storm swirl around you, but there you are protected in my hand. I will guide you and help you. And then after 70 years, I will set you back. All of it is laid out for us. It's all straight. And this is the explanation he's, he's giving to them. There was a covenant. And, and by the way, there's an agreement. See, this is important. You gave your word. Like you gave your word. Now, Zedekiah went back on this covenant. He, he betrayed his word. And what did he do instead? He, did, he thought. I know what let's do. Let's go down to Egypt, and we'll build an alliance with Egypt, and in Egypt and us together, we'll all rebel against Babylon together, and we'll overthrow them. And Jeremiah, the prophet, said, that's a really dumb plan. It's not going to work. Do not lean on that bruised reed. Do not do it. That's the second eagle. He goes on. He rebelled against them, verse 15, by sending his envoys to Egypt that they might give him horses and many troops. Will he succeed? Will he who does such things escape? Can he indeed break the covenant and escape? There is something about keeping your word. A covenant is made, you keep your word. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the country of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, in Babylon he shall die. All fulfilled. And Pharaoh, the second eagle, with his mighty army and great company, will not help him in the war when they cast up mounds and build siege walls to cut off many lives. Now he despised the oath by breaking the covenant. And behold, he pledged his allegiance. Yet did all of these things. He shall not escape. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely my oath which he despised, my covenant, my covenant, which he broke. I'm going to inflict this on his head. And I will spread my net over him, and he will be caught in my snare. Then I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there regarding the unfaithful act which he has committed against me. And all the choice men and all his troops will fall by the sword. The survivors will be scattered to every wind. And you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it. 
Now, this is interesting in verse 22. He kind of adds something to the parable. Very interesting. Thus says the Lord God, I shall also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. I shall pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one. One. I'm going to pluck one. And I'm going to plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain of Israel, I'm going to plant it. That it may bring forth boughs and bear fruit and become a stately cedar. And birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. And all the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I will bring down the high tree. I will exalt the low tree. Dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will do it. What does this last few verses mean? This is absolutely interesting. It is a prophecy of none other than Jesus Christ. Because he takes a, a, a twig, a shoot from the uppermost branch from David. Jesus is called the son of David. And he's going to plant him in Israel. This is a prophecy. Many have seen it. It is an indication that the Messiah will be of the lineage of David, will be planted in Israel on the mountain of Israel, on the mountain on which Jerusalem sits. And there it will be, he describes it like a tree. It will be a stately cedar and bear birds of every kind will nest under it. The people, the nations will come. They'll nest in the shade of its branches. We're blessed under the shade. We're living in the shadow of the Almighty. And all of the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. All the trees, it's another picture for us. He's the mighty stately cedar. The other trees will know that I am the Lord when they see the mighty one. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he goes on, I will bring down the high tree. There are so many things in this world that are wrong today. I'm going to bring down the one that thinks he's high, he's coming down. The one who is low and humble, I will exalt him. I will dry up the green one, the one who wants to flourish in himself. He will find that it was a mistake. But the dry tree will flourish because he will be in me. I am the Lord. I have spoken. I will perform it. A little nugget, a little treasure for us, right, and tucked into the chapter that kind of help us to see again a little taste of prophecy of Jesus kind of tucked in there amongst the verses uh, uh, against Israel. Chapter 18. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Okay, so there was this proverb that they were using in Babylon, the, the Jews. What do you mean by using this proverb? Why are, you, why are you saying this? He's confronting the people. He says, what do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, the fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge? Why do you say this? Stop saying this. As I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Stop using this proverb. Now, first of all, we should say, what does it mean and why are they using it? Well, what it means is, it's an expression. It was a, a saying, a proverb of the day. Uh, the fathers eat the sour grapes. The children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, if, if you eat sour grapes, uh, have you ever eaten sour grape? You know, it, it's, you know, accidentally, you would never on purpose eat a sour grape. But you put a sour grape in your mouth, and you know right away you've eaten sour grape. It's, mm, like this. And so when you eat a sour grape, your teeth are set on edge. You go, you bite into it, you go, mm, like that. You, mm, your teeth are set on edge. Right? You go, mm, that's terrible. Mm. You eat the sour grape, your teeth are set on edge. That's the normal cause and effect. You ate a sour grape, mm, your teeth are set on edge. He's saying, wait a minute, here's, here's the problem, here's the problem. The fathers ate the sour grapes. The children are the ones, their teeth are on edge. That's not right. That's not right. Now, what does this mean in Israel? It was the fathers who sinned. 
and now we're paying the price for it. They rebelled, they turned against the Lord, they had every, they're the ones who sinned. Now we're paying the price for it. We're in Babylon, we're suffering, we got exiled, we have all these things against us, we lost our homeland, we lost everything. And why did we lose everything? Because of our fathers, that's what. We don't deserve this, it was our fathers who did it. Doesn't that kind of remind you of the modern blame somebody else thing? You know the modern blame somebody else thing is not so modern. Actually, it's been going on for a long time. You know how old this blame somebody else thing has been going on? This thing has been going on so long, it started with Adam and Eve. That's how long it was. Because remember, after Adam sinned, you know, and God confronted him, Adam, you know, uh, and what is this? And he said, do you remember what he said? It was, but here's a double. It was a double whammy. He didn't just say it was that woman. It, it actually, it sounds kind of bad when you say it that way. It was that woman. It was that woman that you gave me. You gave her to me, and then she did it. I think both of you are, are to blame. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't me. This is the same thing. It's the, the blame thing all over again. And it's the mantra of our age. Man, don't take responsibility. It's got to be somebody else's fault. Somebody else, you know, the, the decisions you made really, are, you know, let's, let's soothe the poor soul here. You know, it's got to be somebody else's fault. Probably your parents. Let's start with them. Especially if they're gone. They're easy to blame. Wouldn't it be easy? I could. I could blame. My, you know my story. My father was an alcoholic, abusive, dysfunctional family, poorest of the poor that I knew. That's an excuse. I, I, have, I have no way I can do anything with my life, my father. But see, we have to make a choice in this life, don't we? We have to make a choice. When we stand before the throne of God, we'll answer for one life and one life alone, ours. Each one of us, each one of us will give an account of what we did with this life. Each one, one. You have one life to explain your own. We say, well, that's kind of a, it's kind of an ominous turn in the sermon here, Pastor. You kind of got heavy on us here. Yeah, I'm in Ezekiel. The whole thing is heavy. But isn't it true? That is the fact. But here's the glorious good news. We've all made some really stupid decisions in life. We've all fallen into hard times. We've all made some dumb moves. The Lord gives grace to the humble, forgiveness and mercy. He will take you in. In fact, it's part of the story. It's part of the story. Let's just read it. As I live, verse 3, don't use this proverb anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. All souls are mine. Everyone who breathes, breathes because God gave them breath. All souls belong to me. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul who sins will die. He's, he's being straightforward here. Now, I will tell you this, though. Let's add some perspective this is spoken to Israel during the time that they lived under the Old Testament laws, the Old Covenant. They lived by the law. And so what is going to happen now is he's going to explain this in the context of the law. Now, one of the things we have to then understand is that we are not under the law. We are under a different covenant, a new covenant. Not like the old one, which they broke. A new covenant, initiated by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus 
when he had that supper with his disciples, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. They knew about the new covenant because it's right there in Jeremiah 31. We read it when we were there. This is the cup of the new covenant initiated in my blood. Take this, drink it, in remembrance of my death. Do this until I come. Because it is by his death, by his blood poured out, that cup is a picture of his blood, by his blood poured out, all of our sins are forgiven. So that we are under that covering, under the shadow of that glorious answer to our sins. He's paid it all. The sin has been wiped clean. The slate has been made pure. As far as the east is from the west, so has he removed our transgressions from us. So that when you stand before the glorious throne of God, <clears throat> you can stand with your sins completely forgiven. All of them. Every single last one. Wiped completely clean. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that? Of course you believe that's why you're here. But you get my point? Isn't that a large thing to comprehend? We should never take it for granted. We should understand it in the fullness. Now, when you get back to chapter 18, he's talking to a people under the law, and they therefore must live by the law. And so he says it this way, though the one who sins will die, verse 5, if the man is righteous and practices justice and righteousness, and he's going to describe this, he does not eat at the mountain of shrines. Don't go to the mountain of shrines. Do not lift up your eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. Watch your eyes. Be careful of your eyes. Be careful of what feeds your soul. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. Sexual sin is important because it touches the soul. Nor does he approach a woman during her menstrual period. Blood, if you remember, was very significant because of what it represented, life. And so this was a part of the law given to Israel. If a man does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge. Uh, if a person was going to borrow, he would give a pledge. Well, when it's repaid, you give the pledge back. It's, can you have some integrity here? Give the pledge back. So he says, he restores the, to the debtor his pledge. He does not commit robbery. I will not take what is not mine. That's an honest, integrous heart. But he gives bread to the hungry. He's got compassion. He gives bread. He's considerate to the poor. And he covers the naked with clothing. He's generous to those in need. If he does not lend money on interest or take increase, they were not allowed to charge interest to their fellow Jewish brother. If he keeps his hand from iniquity and executes true justice between man and man, if he walks in my statutes, and my ordinances, so as to deal faithfully. He is righteous, and he will live, declares the Lord God. It's very interesting. Interesting description of righteousness. Now, it's important for us to understand that there are two forms of righteousness. I think this is important because we need to understand what we are and what we have in Christ. There are two parts, you might say, two parts of righteousness. One is the avoidance, and you can see this here. One is the avoidance of things that are sinful or bad. The avoidance. So, uh, and he kind of describes this. He does not go to the mountain of shrines. He does not lift up his eyes to eat. You avoid these things, this aspect of righteousness of avoiding things. But the second part is the obedience, what you do. 
In other words, you could live your life and avoid certain sins and then think that you've done well. I, I, I did good things. I, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I didn't rob a bank. And I, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't steal anything, anything really. And uh, I, I kept my lying to a minimum. And I, I've, you know, never uh, stepped out of my wife. You know, uh, so I think I'm pretty righteous. You know, I think I'm pretty, I'm doing pretty good. To which we would say, um, the scripture says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. I don't think you've even started touching on a thing. What about, what about obedience to the Lord? Didn't he give you breath? Didn't he give you life? What about honoring the one who made you? Have you, have you done that with your life? Have you worshiped your king? He gave you breath. You owe him your allegiance. You owe him your life. Yeah, I was, I was in Russia one time, and I was talking to this uh, fellow and, uh, over breakfast, and, and uh, we were talking about God. And, and at one point he said, I got a question for you. I got a question. Why can't God just leave me alone? You know? Why can't I just live my life? Why, why, does, why doesn't God just leave me alone? I said, you know what? That's a good question. Here's my answer. Because he made you. Every breath you take was given by him. Everything you've ever done was by the power and strength he gave you. And now... You say this? I said, let me ask you a question. Imagine, imagine that I uh, make a computer. I go build, buy the parts and I, I, uh, I put it all together and I solder the chips and I put the glass on the screen and I put it all together and I got a computer and then I'm quite clever and I, I write programs all by myself. I don't buy, I write them all myself and I do it all, and I stay up many layers, and I put it all, and I put it into the thing, and I, and I boot it up. I boot up this computer, and then there's this message that comes on the screen to my shock and awe. There's a message. Why can't you just leave me alone? I said, what button should I push next? Well, what should I do with a computer like this? He said, throw it under the train. Are you not worth more than a computer? Are you not more, have not God put into you far greater things than a computer? Are you not much more valuable than a computer? And then you say to God, why can't he leave me alone? What should God do to you, my friend? He smiled, a very big smile. I hope he doesn't throw me under the train. Of course he won't. If you will hear his word, he is offering you an opportunity to have a relationship to your creator, man. He said, I'm this close to becoming a believer. My friend, that close is an eternity. Take the step. Take the step. He made you. He gave you everything. See, righteousness is not just avoiding. It's what you do with your life. Honor God. Walk in love. Walk in obedience. Walk in relationship. It's what you do. It's not just what you avoid. It's what you do. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your help. Because you show us your ways. You honor your name. And I pray, Lord, that tonight we would understand that we have a choice. We get to choose. And I pray, Lord, that we tonight would choose to follow. We would choose to honor you. 
we would choose to live under the shadow of the Almighty. And church tonight, man, I, I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord, but I know that he's calling you. He's calling you to revival. He's calling you to authentic relationship. He may be calling you to repentance. But if he does, if he's calling you to repentance, it's because he loves you. And he's trying to get your feet back on the path of highest blessing and greatest privilege. So tonight, would you even say to the Lord, I choose, I choose to follow I choose to honor. I choose to weave my way through this life filled with the Spirit and filled with life. I choose because I love and I want. I want. I want all this. I want all that's behind the name of Jesus. I want all that you have for me. I want it, Lord, and I'm asking. I choose to follow. I choose. Would you say that to the Lord tonight? Would you just raise your hand? Say to him, you know, spiritually, boldly, I want you to know this, God. I'm lifting my hand because I want you to know it. I choose. This is my choice. It's no one else's choice but mine. I choose all on my own because I want I want to honor you I want to honor you God and can we walk together can we walk this life together show me your ways show me your ways and I'll honor you in Jesus name and everyone said